Lord, I ask that you would open our hearts, Lord. Open our hearts and our minds to receive and our ears to hear. And Lord, touch my lips to speak what you would have me to speak this morning. Praise you, Lord, your wonderful name. Amen. Amen. Last week I talked about winning the battle. And I mentioned how important prayer is in winning the battles that we face. So this week my title is Teach Us to Pray. This comes right out of words from the disciples. They went to Jesus and asked Jesus to teach them to pray. And in Luke 11, 1, it says, It happened that while Jesus was praying in a certain place after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. Just as John also taught his disciples. So they're asking Jesus to teach them how to pray. You also see in Matthew chapter 6, 5 and 6, When you pray, you are not to be like the hypocrites. So Jesus began to give them instruction. First of all, he says, you're not to be like the hypocrites. For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners that they may be seen by men. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. So one of the first things we learn is we're not to pray to be seen by other people. That's not the purpose of prayer. The purpose of prayer isn't to impress the people around us. The purpose of prayer is for us to have communion with God and to speak to God. It says, but you, when you pray, go into your inner room, close your doors, and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Now it's not saying that the only place you should ever pray is in private. But you know what? Having a, a private place where you go to prayer is a good thing. Once in a while we need to get into what people call their prayer closet. You have a spot where you like to go to pray. That's a good thing, but we can also pray together. We just have to remember that when we're praying, we're not doing it to impress other people. Some people don't like to pray around other people because they're afraid that somehow their words aren't good enough. Or that somebody might think they're not very good at praying. Well, you can't worry about that because prayer is not to impress people. Sometimes people pray and it seems like they're trying to impress God with their words. You know what? You can't impress God. I don't know how you, you impress the God who created everything. He loves you. You're His child. He just wants to hear from you. Those of you that are parents, when your kids would come to you and wanted to talk to you, you just wanted to hear from them, right? You just wanted to talk to them. You didn't want them to try to impress you with their words. You just wanted to have that relationship. And that's what it's all about with God. Yes, yes. Prayer is part of our relationship with Him. And it says, And when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition. See, the heathens, when they prayed, they would repeat things over and over and over again. Meaningless. Had no meaning. See, repeating something over and over, repeating the same prayer over and over, doesn't make that prayer stronger, if it's meaningless. It has to have meaning. He says, don't do that as the Gentiles do, for they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. So do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. You know, God already knows what you need. Before you even pray, He already knows what you're in need of. So you don't need to, to repeat over and over a whole formula of things to try to, to get things done. We just need to talk to God as we would talk to to anyone we have a close relationship with. We're going to look at the prayer that he gave us, the Lord's Prayer, because he said, Lord's Prayer. He says, pray then in this way. And we're going to look at some of the things this prayer teaches us. One of the things it teaches us is like a 30-second prayer. Jesus didn't say, pray like this, and then he went on over and all kinds of words. No, he made it very simple. Prayer can be very simple. It's okay to pray long prayers if, if God enjoys you speaking to Him. Yes. And that's okay. But there's sometimes you might not have the time, but take the time to pray at least a 30-second prayer to Him. Now when I decided to, to teach on this, on the Lord's Prayer, 
I had no idea how much this was going to open up to me as I began to really study it and read about it. And, you know, I've seen simple formulas for the Lord's Prayer. It says you do this, this, and this. But when Jesus would teach something, how many know it's important? Every single word you have to pay attention to. Because he could teach so much in so few words that it can just go right by us. He starts out by saying, Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So first we want to address the first part of that, Our Father. Our reminds us that when we entered a relationship with God, we also entered a relationship with His people. He used the word our. You don't pray, my Father. Jesus said, pray, our Father. So remind us that we're not only in a relationship with God, but also with the whole church as one body. We are taught to pray for our and us, not for mine and me. You do not find in the Lord's Prayer anywhere where you pray my, me, I, it's all about our and us. And then we look at the word Father. Father reminds us of our re unique relationship with God. We're not praying, He didn't teach us to pray God in heaven. He said you pray our Father. That's very intimate. Very personal. He is our Father. We have a very unique relationship with God. When you accepted Christ as your Savior, you were adopted into God's family. You are His adopted child. And we are allowed to speak to Him as a Father. Amen. Very personal. And that's how Jesus taught us to speak to God. The same way Jesus spoke to the Father. He called Him Father. Romans 8.15, it says, For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. Abba is the most personal name for God in the Hebrew. That's what you would say like daddy. A child would call their father Abba. The Hebrew word for father is Abba. The two-letter word, but Abba extends that and makes it more personal. It's like when your child runs up and says, Daddy, Daddy. We can call him Daddy because he is our Father. Why? Again, because we have received a spirit of adoption of son as sons. We need to remember that. And that first part of that prayer, those first two words remind us of that. Our, we're part of a body of believers. He is our Father, we are part of a family, and He is our Father. So remember that when you pray. You're praying to your Father. It says, who is in heaven? This reminds us He is the one true God. He is the one in heaven. There is no other God above Him. When we pray, who is in heaven? It's remind us where He is. He is not an earthly father. He is our father in heaven. We are praying to the one true God. Deuteronomy 4.39 says, Know therefore today and take it to your heart that the Lord, He is God in heaven above and on the earth below. There is no other. When we pray who is in heaven, it reminds us of this verse in Deuteronomy. There is no other on earth or in heaven. No other God before Him. And so we're reminded that when we pray, we are praying to the God in heaven, the God that created the universe. Not some little G God that can do nothing for you, as the heathens did. Ecclesiastes 5.2 says, Do not be hasty in word or impulsive in thought to bring up a matter in the presence of God, for God is in heaven and you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. And that's what this prayer teaches us, that we don't need to have many words. We just need to recognize that God is in heaven and we are on earth and who we are praying to. <clears throat> then we pray, hallowed be your name. For holy is your name. This is actually the first petition in the prayer. This is a petition that God's glory and holiness be known and loved as it deserves. 
We as a church are to bear the name of God faithfully. When we hallow God's name, we are bearing God's faithfully. Are you hallowing His name with the way you live your life? When people see how you live your life, are they saying that God is holy? See, Israel didn't always hallow God's name and their behavior. They didn't hold it holy. And by this petition, we're saying, God, we want to hold you holy. Isaiah 6, 3 says, And one called out to the another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. When we pray that, we're reminding ourselves that God is truly holy and that the whole earth is full of His glory. In Revelations, we see again where the angels cry out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty who was and who is and who is to come. Even the angels cried out, God, you are holy. Holy is your name. And I've noticed that in both cases, they say that three times. Why? God the Father, you are holy. God the Son, you are holy. God the Holy Spirit, you are holy. Holy means without blame, without fault, without any error, without sin. God is perfect. And we recognize His perfection when we say holy is your name. In Ezekiel 36, 22, it says, it says, Therefore say to the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, It is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for my holy name. We find oftentimes in Scripture that God speaks about He's doing something to uphold His holy name. And when we pray, Holy is your name, God, we are saying, We are going to help uphold your holy name. Because God said to Israel, Which you have profaned among the nations where you went. We don't want to, as believers, profane the name of God. But when we are not living according to the way God wants us to live, we are profaning His name, just as Israel did. God said, I'm going to act to honor, to bring up my own name, to show that my name is holy. We need to remember that when we pray, who God is. And it's a, those words, holy is your name, should be a moment of examining ourselves. Are we living the way we should live before a holy God? Then it says, Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth, on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus spoke a lot about the kingdom of God coming to earth. Through Jesus, the kingdom of God has come down to earth, and we are recognizing that when we pray, Your kingdom come, your will be done. Not our will, but whose will? We're telling ourselves it's God's will when we pray. Remember that it's God's will that must be done. Take some time to, under, to know what God's will is. We take a lot of time in prayer to tell God what we want done. We tell Him what our will is. God, would you do this? Would you do that? Would you do this? But do we take the time to wait on God to find out what His will is for us? Because we want it to be on earth as it is in heaven. The only way it's going to be that is when God's will is done. What's interesting about this prayer is there's a division in this prayer. The first part of this prayer is all about God. The focus and emphasis and attention is all on God. And then it's the last half of the prayer that we begin to focus on us and our needs. And we pray, give us this day our daily bread. Now notice that Jesus taught us to pray, give us this day. To be concerned about this day because he, he taught that we don't need to be concerned about the future. Don't worry about what's going to come. Only be concerned about what you need today. What do you need today? That's what you should be praying for. God, give me today what I need. You know, He knows what your needs are. Matthew 6, 31-36 says, Do not worry then, saying, What will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear for clothing? The Gentiles eagerly seek all these things, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So even in the Lord's Prayer, we can 
then read the gospel and see how much Jesus expounds upon what he's telling them in this prayer. That's what we pray. God knows what your needs are. He's going to take care of it. Don't worry about tomorrow. But it's okay to lift up your petitions to Him. And then let the worry go. Let God take care of it. That's what prayer is about. Because if we truly trust God, why do we worry? How many of you ever spent time in prayer and then walked away and you were still worried? I have. What's the problem? I didn't reach that point where I was truly trusting God. And if that's a problem, I need to learn in my own life to go back and pray more. Speak to God more. God, I haven't got a victory in this yet. I'm still worrying. Please, God, take away this worry. Help me to believe what your word says. Not to worry that you will take care of my needs. Philippians 4, 6 says well, we're to be anxious for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be known to God. We need to let Him know what our needs are, but then we need to trust Him to take care of those needs. And again, like I said, when we're praying, prayer can go beyond that 30 seconds if we haven't found that peace. See, that's all about us. It's not about what God can do for us. God's ready to do for you. He wants us to get to that place where we're not worried. You know, worry is a sin. How many of us spend hours in worry? We're all guilty at one point or another. I'm confessing to you, I am guilty at times of really worrying about stuff. And then the answer comes. And God speaks to me through my wife. See, you didn't need to worry. Sometimes she reminds me, why are you worrying? But sometimes I'm the one reminding her. We find out that that's what relationships, how they work. There are times when my wife just can't get over that concern and that worry. And I'm telling her, trust God. God's going to take care of it. Amen. And then there's times when it's me. And my wife is telling me, trust God. God will take care. We just need to trust Him. And I'm thankful that I have a partner that reminds me. Because God doesn't want us to be anxious. He doesn't want us to worry. He wants us to trust in Him. Matthew 6, 12. Then. And forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. So the part of prayer is ask God to forgive us. And the word debts is used because sin creates a debt. And that debt is death. The wages of sin is death. We want to ask God to forgive us of our sins, but what? He also says, as we forgive those who have sinned against us. There's a condition there that Jesus taught us when we pray. There's a condition. We need to forgive other people as well. If we want God to forgive us, do you forgive others? I've heard many stories about people who had somebody murder one of their children and then they go and visit that person and forgive them and reach out to them and share the Lord with them in prison. That takes a strong Christian heart to do that. To be able to forgive in that manner and to embrace the person that did the wrong and to share the Lord with them. That's true Christian love. But it's not always easy. I've heard people say, well, I just can't forgive them. I can't do it. Forgiveness sometimes is a process. Sometimes it just begins in prayer. Say, God, I forgive. Mention that person. You may not feel it. You didn't say feel the forgiveness. That comes in time. But as you give it over to God, that hurt that somebody caused against you, and you forgive them in your prayers, God will help you to begin to feel that forgiveness and to let go of that. And it can take time. It's interesting that after teaching this prayer, 
Jesus expounded upon this. He says, for if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Well, we like to stop there. But there's that word, but. But. That's a big word. But, if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your forgot Father forgive your trespasses. Right. Ouch! There's a condition to forgiveness. <laughs> Getting forgiveness from God requires that we forgive people. You know, never forget that. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Not some unrighteousness. All unrighteousness. Scripture tells us that when God forgives us, He separates our sin from us as far as the east is from the west. He casts it into a sea of forgetfulness. God remembers it no more. That means that when you've asked God to forgive you, and then you find yourself standing before Him, you go, God, you know, I, I know right before I died I did such and such, and I'm sorry, He'll look at you, I don't remember that. If you would ask for forgiveness. It's not because God has a bad memory, but God chooses to forgive you. See, He chooses to put them behind the blood of Jesus. See, when He looks at you, and you've asked for forgiveness. He doesn't see your sin. He sees the blood of His Son. It was shed on the cross. And it's covering your sins. He says, I don't remember your sins anymore. That needs to be part of our prayer. We need to take that time to confess our sins to God. And ask for God's forgiveness. That should be part of our sin. Our prayer every time we pray is to ask for our sins to be forgiven. Colossians 3.13 says, Bearing with one another and forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. So when we ask for forgiveness in prayer, Jesus taught us to also forgive others. And he said, Do not lead us into, into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Last part of the prayer is spiritual warfare. Do not lead us into temptation, God. Does that mean God sometimes leads you into temptation? No, it doesn't. What it means is that we're asking God, God, please don't let me fall into temptation. Don't let temptation overtake me. Temptation always comes before sin. And the Bible tells us that God always gives us a way out. There's always a way out. The problem is we don't always look for it. Because we're not winning the battle up here. Temptation starts up here. Starts either with we see something we want, or we desire something in our flesh, or our pride tells us that we want it. Those, those are the types of where temptation comes from. But there's always a way of escape. When we pray, lead us not into temptation, we're saying, show me, God, the way to escape this. Show me how to get away from this temptation. Show me the door to get away. Help me to be like Joseph when I'm tempted to run from it. Read the story of Joseph when he was tempted by Potiphar's wife. He ran. He knew to get out of the room. We need to learn that as well. Deliver us from the evil one. For those that don't believe that there is an evil one to be delivered from. They don't believe that there's evil. There is an adversary. Referred to as Satan. The word Satan is actually not his name. Satan means adversary. We have an adversary. That wants to separate us from God. And he knows that one of the ways to separate you from God is through sin. Now sometimes it's our own flesh that starts the temptation. But boy, you open the door, Satan's going to step in, the adversary's going to step in, and he's going to go, okay, you open the door, I'm going to help you step through it. Because that separates us from God when we sin. That's why it's so important every time we pray to do what? Confess our sins. 
And in Matthew, there's two versions of the Lord's Prayer. Matthew adds the ending, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. That portion is, is, some Bibles is out underlined or in parentheses because it was found in later manuscripts. And, and they'll, you'll say if you have a, a new international version like I do, it says this was added in later manuscripts because they felt like the prayer ended too abruptly. But actually, when you say it goes back to the first century, it can be traced back that far, that this was part of the prayer, so it may very well belong there. Um, just put that, because depending on what version of your Bible says may have that or not. But we're ending in praise. So when we pray, our focus begins on God. When you pray, when you take time to pray, say, I don't know how to pray. Well, it's easy. First, focus on God. Our Father. You are my Father. You are in heaven and you are holy. Praise God. God, you have created all things. You are wonderful. You have done so much for me. I love you and I praise you. Begin your prayer there. And then pray, God, let your will be done. Before you start telling God what your needs are, confirm that you believe it's His will, not your will that needs to be done. Jesus, in the garden, He prayed that God would take the cup away from Him. That maybe He wouldn't have to go to the cross, but where do you see? But not my will, let your will be done. We see in prayer, He still prayed it. But he recognized that ultimately it was God's will. We need to remember that when we pray as well. When we begin to add our petitions. God, give me today what I need. God, today I have some bills to pay. Take away the debt. You know, that word has two meanings. When we say, you know, forgive us our debts, it has both the meaning of sin, but it also has the meaning of debt. <coughs> and I've read different commentators look at it both ways. That we're praying for sin, but we could also be praying that God will remove our financial debts. Provide for us. But again, whose will is it? God is going to do it His way, in His timing, but we need to ask. So when you pray, God, give me today what I need. There's no food in the house. God, would you put some food in the house? If God answers prayer, we saw that in our lives on many occasions. I shared one time, there was a just a place we were at where we were down to eggs and potatoes. And my wife makes really good potatoes and eggs. So we weren't suffering. But that's about what we had. And we were praying, God, provide for us. Went out to the mailbox and there was a $250 gift card for the grocery store. That many years ago, we to this day don't know where that came from. But God used somebody. That's how God works. He spoke to somebody and said, they need a little help right now. So God answers your prayer. But that needs to be part of it. Tell Him what your need is, but then trust Him. And wait back and wait to see what God is going to do. And then we need to do spiritual warfare when we pray. The church has gotten so far away from spiritual warfare. We don't know how to fight the enemy anymore. We don't know how to fight temptation. We don't look for the way out of it. That needs to be part of our prayer. Lead us not into temptation. Show me, God, how to get away from this temptation. All of us need to do that. Deliver us from the evil one. Do you know what evil one you're facing? One of the gifts of the Spirit is the discerning of spirits. And it's not used enough in the church. I talked about that last week in the message winning the battle. That we're fighting against powers and principalities and rulers of darkness. And we can spend a lot of time doing stuff in the flesh. And not really fighting the battle probably because we don't know who the enemy is. We need to ask God, show me. God, I know that.
there's an oppressive spirit over my community. What is it? And He will give you the name. It will come as an impression to you. And then pray against that spirit. There's a spirit of witchcraft in this community. I know we've felt that. We've prayed against it. And I've had it confirmed by many different people that have grown up in this community. That has been part of this community. It didn't just go away. We need to be coming against that in prayer. When we gather on Wednesday nights, when we gather in our community prayer time, we're praying against that spirit. There are other spirits that are oppressing our community. Telling you over our county there's a spirit of, of sorcery. And you read what the word for sorcery is in the Bible in the New Testament, it's pharmakia. Pharmakia has to do has to do with the use of drugs and potions to alter people's minds. We have a drug problem in Calaveras County. But because it's been hidden, a lot of people just kind of ignore it. For a while there were a lot of meth houses in Calaveras County. A lot of methamphetamines were made here. Now it's cannabis. And I, you know, you know how I feel about it. It's a mind-altering drug. The Bible says we're not to alter our minds. That's a spirit of pharmakia. A spirit of sorcery. A lot of people think sorcery, you know, we think because of the, we see a guy with a pointed hat and he got a big staff and he's the sorcerer. And that's, that's not what sorcery was in the Bible. It was the use of drugs. They used mind-altering drugs in their pagan worship and rituals. Because you can gain influence over people when you dumb down their minds. Yeah. And that's what's happening in our world today. We need to be praying against it. Those are just some of the things. I think I shared last week about praying with my wife or her sister-in-law. And we weren't sure what to be praying. And we were, as we were praying, God told me, pray against the spirit of self-destruction. Spirit of suicide. We came against that. We found out later that she was contemplating suicide. We didn't know that. We just knew she needed prayer. But if you take the time, God will show you. But that is one of the gifts of the spirit. We focus a lot on prophecy, tongues, and interpretation. Those are important gifts. But we need to focus more on some of the other gifts. Like the discerning of spirits. And we'll be talking more this year about some of those gifts, because I'd like to see more of the gifts functioning in the church. What about the gift of miracles? Yes. We have people within our body that need miracles. Yes. That's a gift of the church. But we ignore it. And it goes along with the gift of faith. When we have people in here that are sick, but we hear about somebody that's diagnosed with cancer or something. God might put upon you the gift of faith and you might just feel welling up inside of you. I, I, we need to pray for them. God wants to heal them. You know what? You're the one with the gift of faith. You need to go lay hands on them and pray for them. But oftentimes what we do with that is we say when we feel that gift coming upon us, we go tell somebody else to do it. When you feel it, that means God wants you to do it. He's given you that gift. But it's scary. It's scary to use it. Go, oh, what if nothing happens? know what? Let His will be done. Sometimes He does just to see if you're going to be faithful. He's already got a plan in the works, but He wants you to be part of it. He wants to see if you're going to be faithful. See, prayer costs us something. Again, we don't need to be like the heathens. We don't need to be like the pagans that pray multiple words and repeat things over and over. Like taking the Lord's Prayer, you can pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day the bread we need. You, know, you can pray that prayer, but you need to do it with meaning. If those words actually have meaning to you, then pray it. But if you start repeating that prayer over and over and over, and it doesn't really have any meaning, that's not prayer. That's not what Jesus was teaching. He's saying, don't do that. Because see, that's what the Pharisees did. That's what the heathens did. Is they would just repeat the same words over and over. And they'd do it in public so everybody would see them. And, oh, look at him, how pious he is. He, 
He prays without ceasing over and over. But it was meaningless. God is saying, put meaning to it. If it's easy for you to write down a prayer and read that prayer, if that's easier for you to do, that is perfectly okay. I had a book at home, somebody called Prayers That Avail As Much, and it's a bunch of prayers over different things. And you fill in, you know, the names and things, that's fine. If those words have meaning to you, if you're just reading it meaningless, it's, that's what it is. So, number one in prayer, mean what you're saying. You are talking to God, your Father in Heaven. Have a conversation with Him. Some of you might like to have a conversation with God in King James English. So that's perfectly okay. Not necessary, but if that's how you like to talk to God, that's great, if it has meaning. But you can talk to God just like I'm talking to you. That's prayer. It's having fellowship with God, speaking to Him, letting Him know where you're at, what your needs are, and also giving a little time for Him to talk to you. So often we pray and we get up and we leave and we don't just sit there for a moment to see if that still small voice is going to speak to us. That's where we get things like the discerning of spirits. When you're praying for somebody, you're praying for your community, you take a moment and just let that still small voice, maybe a, a word will come to you. A word of witchcraft. You go, oh, he's telling me the spirit I need to go against. We need to take that time. But so often when we pray, we Another room we can do our way, then boop, we're off and we're gone. We need to learn to wait on the Lord a little bit. It takes practice. But you know what? When you begin to see God moving, you see the answers coming. It's such a blessing. The Lord, teach us to pray. That's my word for you today. Ask him, just like the disciples, God, teach me to pray. But it needs to be a part of your life. Don't always look for somebody else to do your praying for you. Amen. I can't have a relationship with God for you. You have to have a relationship with him also. It's okay to ask other people to pray for you and along with you if you're also praying. But don't always ask somebody you know, always to do it for you. And if you feel a need, and, and just want to address one more thing. If you're here, you're at church, and you feel a need, or somebody shows that you feel a need, that they need prayer, pray for them. So often we want to then take that person and bring them to somebody else and say, would you pray for this person? My prayers aren't any more powerful than your prayers. My wife's prayers aren't any more powerful than your prayers. If God has put it on your heart, then you're the one that He wants to pray. That's that, like that gift of faith. Maybe He has just given you the gift of faith for that person. Don't... See, what stops us is we're so afraid we're, we're, we're not going to sound good when we pray. It's okay if you stutter when you pray. Because God knows your heart. He knows what you're asking before you ask it. And if you don't have all the right words, that's okay because He knows your heart. But if He put it on you, then you follow it because He might be trying to teach you something through that. That's a challenge. That if you're in a situation and God puts upon you somebody and He says to you, in your spirit, you feel, they need, they need prayer. Pray for them. Don't run to somebody else and say, could you go pray for that person? Because God hasn't put it upon them. That's what that our part of our Father is all about. He's our Father. We're all one body. He wants to use each and every one of us. Every person has a purpose and a place in the body, and all of us are used at different times. You know, if I'm hungry, and my hand doesn't feel like putting food in my mouth, I don't run to my foot and say, foot, would you feed me? Because that's not its job. To understand what I'm saying? If God is putting it on your heart and telling you that somebody needs prayer, follow through and pray for them. And take advantage when prayer is offered. I can't tell you how many times in church we get up here in front because the Bible says that the elders of the church 
anoint you with oil and pray the prayer of a righteous man and God will answer that prayer. The Bible says that. We get up here, elders, to pray for you. Nobody comes forward for prayer and as we're trying to walk out the door to go, look, somebody comes up and says, why well, I needed prayer today for such and such. Why didn't you come up? You know, that's where we let the flesh get in the way. You're afraid, well, if I go up there and ask for prayer, somebody's going to think something's wrong with me. <laughs> right? Yeah. Well, that's their problem. Not yours. Just because somebody comes up for prayer doesn't mean there's something wrong with them. They may have some, they may be coming to Mass and prayer for somebody else. That's none of your business. But don't let that stop you. So often in churches, when they open the altar and they say, you know, take some time, come up in the front, bow down and pray, people won't do it. Well, somebody will think there's something wrong with me if I do that. We need to get over that. Humble yourself. Yes. That's what the Bible says. Let's bow our heads for just a moment. If anybody is here today and you don't have a relationship with Christ, that's where prayer begins. God doesn't hear your prayers until you have a relationship with Him. And if you're here today and you need to accept Christ as your Savior, don't leave this place without Him. Not anybody looking around, if there's anybody at all that would like to accept Christ this morning, just slip your hand up. There's some of you here today in need of prayer. Maybe you just need help in your prayer life. If that's you and you say, you know what God, I just need you to, to help me to have a better prayer life. Slip your hand up. Lord, I thank you and I praise you, Lord, for your word. All of us, Lord, need fellowship with you. You are our Father. You are Abba. Father in heaven, I ask you to help us. To learn to come to you when we have needs. To learn to trust you with the answers. And I ask you by your Holy Spirit that you would give us a boldness and an unction to be people of prayer. And Lord, help us when we see somebody else, when somebody asks us or shares a need with us and we feel like they need prayer, to just stop and pray for them. Sure. To not let the moment pass or get away from us. We see that the prayer, the model that you gave us is a 30-second prayer. We certainly could take 30 seconds at any time in our day to pray for somebody when they ask. Help us to be a people of prayer, Lord. Because we know that when we are a people of prayer, our relationship with you can only grow, can only get stronger. We want to have a stronger relationship with you. We thank you so much for all that you've done for us. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. And be sure to get some hand sanitizer. <laughs> That's just a, you know, not a bad thing to do. Wash your hands a lot this week so you're not sick, so you'll be back next week. We'll be here on Wednesday night for prayer at 6.30. We're really trying to keep that first half hour as a time of prayer. When you come in, we try to put some music on and just to come in and find a place and spend that time praying. And then we come together before we have the Bible study. And if you want to just come for the prayer time from 6.30 to 7, you're more than welcome to do that. You can't stay for the Bible study. Because prayer is more important than anything. And that's how we're going to begin to see things change in our world. It's going to be through prayer. It's not going to be through shouting at people and trying to change people's opinions on things. We spend an awful lot of time doing that. And really, prayer is, is really what the matter is. Enjoy your day today. Prayer.